have been labeled as the guy who wants to change the world. If I had um, seen the notice earlier, I would have edited it. Uh, who can even assay to do such a task? And the world has already been saved and changed by another. All I seek to do is to expose this hidden good news. I was born in a village state. My father was an itinerant, um, itinerant uh, um, worker, occupied working for the Nigerian Railways, later the NPA. So I adopted a local cosmopolitan favor as he was transferred from one capital city to another. Please, I hope you don't mind. I have to read this so that, okay. Uh, he was transferred to Lagos, to Portacot, to Calabar. In those days, the Nigerian Railway and the NPA staff were drawn from all over Nigeria. We lived in staff quarters, um, having Yorubas, Igbos, and Hausas, our neighbors. That was a sure cure for tribalism and communal living. Then the Civil War broke out, and I was sent home to the village of my origins. And I beheld there an unprecedented phenomenon, a true communal living lifestyle full of love. My father had two brothers, and they all lived together in their two, with their two wives each in one large compound. Each wife had a front door opening into a courtyard and a back door opening the echo. Echo means backyard, for those who can't speak a Bible. And then these doors were open all day, and as we enjoyed running around, okay? I tell you, it was a big courtyard, so as kids would run into one of the rooms, run out the other as we were playing hide and seek, and we were playing catch me if you can. And, you know, there was so much love because no doors were locked. We had so much love, we mixed together. And um, whenever we were running at the first Something happened. I don't know those, I mean, I hope we have some people from the 50s, 60s here. <laughs> okay. So whenever we're running around and you walk, in, you run into any of the houses and you were grabbed by thirst, all you did was there was this spot at the corner. You, okay. Somebody's like, you, you, you've been there. <laughs> so there was a pot at the corner, you know, for water. And then as kids, we'll just run into any of the rooms. You pick up the cup. Okay, and then you dip, it was an enamel cup, remember? Enamel cup. Now you pick up the cup, you dip into the pot, you take some water, you drink and you move on. And you know the amazing thing, sometimes the pot was so full, right? So that without, if you picked up the cup, you could, you could as a kid, your hand could go right in to your, to, 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 to your elbows. And you know the amazing thing, because of love, so much love, there was no cholera. And then the war ended. And I had to go back to the city. Went back to Enugu to study art at the IMT Enugu. Now, I tell you what, I've done some paintings. I'm trying to save the system. People said, well, you want to be a messiah, you want to save the system. And I said, why not? Why sit on the fence? And so what happened was I started painting about the way I felt, trying to change the system. And I started paint, highlighting the things I saw, the ills in the society. But it didn't work out. The more I went into that, the more people felt bad. Because you can't use evil. You can't use the things that are bad to change the things that are bad. You use the positive to change the negative. And then halfway through, in my you know, groping to see what I could do to change the system through my art, Jesus found me. And you know what better way for someone to save the system or to save the world than when the savior of the world himself you know, comes into your life. And so... From 1980, 81, no, no, 91, when he came into my life, my art changed. My art, it was not abysmal anymore. Aside from that point onwards, to start trying to use love, show love in my paintings, show the old values that we had, show the love we used to have, the communal love. And then from there, hopefully, by God's grace, change the system through that. So now I'll go to the painting so we could look at them. This is the painting I call Armageddon. Uh, it was just faces, lots of faces in anguish, people moving around with tombstones in their eyes. That was when I was trying to change the system without Jesus, okay? And so I was showing the people moving around with tombstones in their eyes, negative headlines surrounding them, negative newspaper headlines, because there was a blanket of negativity in the, in the country at the time. 
So that was the Armageddon, the first one I did, called Armageddon, No Place to Hide. Then the next one, ah, too bad. I hope it's clear enough. <laughs> I hope it's clear enough. Well, this second one is called Wet Dreams. It had to do with somebody in the village, hoping to run away from the village, thinking that it was too negative there, to run to the city for help, and then he would wake up. Okay, that's the, the man there, tied up to his roots, looking up to the city to get there, but soon he wakes up to the fact that, look, it's everywhere. You know, it was just a wet dream. <laughs> okay, a friend of mine now ran to New York, hoping that New York was better, you know? And so he took off. This one is called Anidin, New York. He ran to New York with his mat, and skyscrapers overwhelmed him. He couldn't take it. Low self-esteem brought him back to the country. <laughs> you know? So that's what I call Anidin, New York. And then this is the last I'm showing for the Armageddon series. The yearning. This is a lady who's reaching out to somebody, to something, looking for, lusting for something that is better. You know? And you know, I used a mail to, to, to show what she's reaching out for. The, see how long the hands are. But she's, the, the man actually is concave. The impression of the man is concave. And she's convex. It, it, there's no meeting point. You cannot reach out for the spiritual through the physical. Actually, this is, my works are autobiographical. I guess that, that was, <laughs> my works are kind of autobiographical. I could see myself in those paintings. As I kept on changing, this was getting close when I was reaching out for something that was not there. I thought I was reaching out for something in the positive, you know, when I was reaching out for, the, for, for, for him, for the Lord. And then he found me, okay? And now salvation. Okay, that's it. That's when uh, I reached out and I was grabbed. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then he grabbed me out of the murky waters, you know, and put me on a platform where I can talk um, more about love. Okay, now I started telling love stories through my exhibitions. You see, I started talking about values that we've lost. Parents, I live in Lagos. The crazy thing about Lagos is kids, parents wake up at four o'clock in the morning and they take off to work, okay? And then they come back at nine o'clock, there's no time for their kids. They don't know what happens. On Sunday, they have a bit of time and then on Monday they're off again. So I started pointing to the values that we had where parents used to have time for their children, you know, and would teach them things. This artwork here is called Sacrifice. It's a true story. My father told me that there was a man opposite our compound who sold his last rapa. You know, the, you know how those rapa materials were precious in those days? And his son needed to go. And so he sold his last rapa material to provide a covering for his son to go to school. And thereafter, he started. <laughs> There's the guy there, and he's using that rapa as an umbrella to cover his child. And look at the child has swagger, you know? You see? So that is sacrifice. And I keep telling people, I say, hey, come. You know, listen, this thing happened, these were values that we had, values of sacrifice. Sacrifice for your child. And then for me, this is on the primary, uh, the tertiary level. On the primary level, somebody sacrificed for us to give us a call so that we could have swagger also. And that's the Lord Jesus, okay? Now, this is a painting I call them um, Adaize. You know all these kids, this is uh, the daughter of the king. You know you cannot touch a king's head. If you touch a king's head, you're dead. But his little baby can touch the head and plait the hair, you know? So this is uh, uh, the king wanting to relax. And the Adai, Adai decides to, at that time to plait the hair. So the title of this work is, Daddy, keep your head one place, so I go beat you. <laughs> it's only an Adaize that can do that to the king, minus that. So I'm talking about values that we have, things that, values that we've lost. I don't think parents in Lagos, I don't, I, don't know about, I don't know about Calabar, would have time for their kids this way. And now this is another one, um, spending time with children still. This one happened in front of my house. My father saw the other one, I saw this one, you know, where a mother, you know, pregnant woman, covered the child from the rain, and she stayed in the rain and covered her child, took all the weight from her, took her bags, and the child could play with flowers. <laughs> That's love. And then this is another one. Um, I call this one Love Story, uh, number five, where a father is spending time teaching his daughter how to weave baskets, you know. Uh, this, this is, women are the most amazing people in the world. Don't let their softness fool you. These people are, that's a disguise, so women are awesome. 
<laughs> you know? In this, in this painting, this is a, a mother who's giving birth, uh, bathing four children. Her quadruplets. You know something? And she's not ruffled. She's doing her job fantastically and taking care of all of them. No hypertension. I mean, if it was a male, the guy would freak out. That, that <laughs> I, I, I would freak out. My wife is incredible with this sort of thing. I call this is love to her. <laughs> and, and this is, you know, this, it's only mothers. You know, mother is lying down. The child just lies down with his book and puts the, the mother's leg is like a pillow. You know, I'm sorry, the back is like uh, a leg rest. You know, only mothers, you know, that's another love story. I don't know why we still have time for this. That's daddy plating the daughter's hair. A day is a steal. <laughs> and, and that's a daughter plating mommy's hair. You know, the opposite. You know, when, when you love, they love you back. It's always that way. When you don't love, and I think there's a problem, there's a deficit of love in the world today especially in Nigeria. That's why we're seeing all the things we're seeing. When we get back to love, all these things will disappear. Okay? And, well, father and mother teaching the child how to crawl. You know, remember the old way? You know, forget the workers. You know, now you put the child in the worker and you just go do your thing. But in those days, it was hands-on. You put the child there, and the child is crawling, and you're teaching the child how to crawl, how to walk, and all that. <laughs> okay, this one is called uh, Find by Force. <laughs> I actually saw this in my neighborhood. You know, I'm sure this was Sunday evening. I'm sure they were trying to prepare the kid for, for the next school day, day. And this kid was sleeping. The kid was that way, you know. But mommy had to make the kid fine by force, you know. And, you know, for me, this is a metaphor. A metaphor in the sense that, listen, hey, God wants to make us fine by force, no matter what we do. He wants to love us and make us fine by force, you know. All, all my works are metaphorical. <laughs> this is letter from overseas. This is the letter has come and they're all reading it. I don't know whether it's clear from there. You remember the blue envelope that used to happen in those days? Everything, <laughs> pavion, eh? That's letter from overseas. Everybody has come to listen to the letter. The same find by force, love songs. I tell a lot of these stories you know, over and over again. You know, the mommy is selling, but she doesn't forget the child. If the child just goes, eh, mommy will turn back. You know, mothers are amazing, honestly. Let's give a hand for mothers, I beg. I beg. Uh, it's not, mothers are the most awesome. My, my wife is, my wife is the greatest, you know, she's, um, uh, okay, that's mother and child cooking together. This happened in my studio. I heard them singing together while preparing food, and I had to paint that. Uh, this one, this is, this is called Love Songs, Blowing the Wind. He's being nostalgic, playing songs, missing home, you know, just like I'm missing the past, how it used to be. This is father. The father here is uh, Hausa. The son is Igbo, and they're making, they're making music together. You know, <laughs> same thing here. You know, this is the, the son's. The first time the son is playing music, and the father is surprised. Look at his eyes. Oh my boy! You know, that's the title. And then this is um, Hausa man, Igbo lady playing music. I have to run. Same thing. Igbo Igbo man, Hausa woman playing music, love songs. This is. A, an amazing story, you know, when mothers used to do their children's hair and they didn't send their children to hairdressers, you know what was happening? The amazing thing is that as they are doing the child's hair and the child is crying, they start singing love songs. Adam, oh, Adam. You know, you know the songs? They sing the most beautiful songs of love. Adam, oh, they sing love songs to the child. And you know something? Those love songs made the child, they were installations for the future. That's why you can't see women of my generation freaking out. They don't tell you, I mean, hey, very stable because of the love songs in them. Mighty installations of love. You know, and then the child would just say, Mommy, you know, it's, it's, it's not difficult. It's not easy to keep a child steady. And then they start singing the love songs, singing the love songs, you know, and then they'll do the hair. And those love songs are installed forever, you know. Well, Agape, Agape, different tribes playing uh, each other's instruments and loving them. Different tribes on the same mat and they're eating together from the same plate. No fear of poisoning because they love each other, you know. And then this one, in him we live, in him we move, in him we have a being. In God, we all hold together. Out of God, we scatter. <laughs> okay. Well, that's an Akwaibum, uh, or an Ethic, and a Yoruba woman booging down, you know. They're doing their thing together. That's a love story. And then, this one is called, um, uh, this is called, 
God, the, the greatest joy of God is to explode sons into the world. You know, he, he gave birth to sons. That's the greatest joy of God. This one is called um, uh, Love Songs, Love Story. God's heart exploding in joy and giving birth to children into the world, you know, getting them born again. Now, this is called foreplay, love story foreplay. You know, it shows, um, <laughs> it shows um, different tribes, Yoruba woman, Igbo man. Look at their leg intertwined, you know, in love. And look at the child on the back enjoying himself. I mean, this, this, and they're playing the old like your game. That's, that's called love, uh, love, um, love songs, love stories. Different tribes together on the same plate. Leadership, this is called leadership. You know, you pour into the other, the one pours into this one, and you all make, um, you know, it's called leadership. Same story. This one is, um, I call this the old rugged cross. 2,000 years old, rugged, but it's still bearing fruit. Still bearing fruit. And this one is called the ultimate love song. Okay? This is God playing using the guitar as a cross and playing a song to us. Yeah.